Hello, my friends. It's Nick, the ASMR nerd. And today I've got a simple, kind of old school uh, store haul slash what's in my bag video. Uh, I enjoy watching these kinds of ASMR videos. The, kinds of videos where people show off what they've picked up uh, recently shopping or or just showing off kind of what they've got in you know their bags or purses or whatever I don't know for whatever reason I just find them really chill anyway um, apologies my voice sounds a little strange I'm still getting over a cold it's been a nasty one uh, in fact I'd hoped this was going to be a whisper video by whispering is surprisingly quite stressful on the vocal cords, so it's easier for me to speak softly like this. So you're going to get a slightly deep-voiced Nick for this video. Anyway, uh, so this is a bag of treasures that I picked up from a local games store. And uh, this store is called uh, the Vorpal Gnome, which is a great name. Uh, it's run by a, a really friendly guy, uh, and it's full of all kinds of uh, mostly used gaming collectibles, paraphernalia, just all kinds of stuff. And it's not just video games. In fact, it's mostly tabletop games, card games you know, miniatures, all that kind of stuff, although there is a lot of, you know, video game swag there as well. Uh, and so what I've got here in the bag today is all old stuff. Um, it's all stuff that's very nostalgic for me, uh, which is why I bought it. Um, and I got a pretty good deal on it because uh, the Vorpal Gnome is having, or was having, a, a moving sale. Uh, they're going to be moving to a different location, so they were looking to uh, clean out a bunch of stock. And so I, I got what I think is a pretty good deal on these items, and I, I'm going to reveal them one by one, you know, so as not to give up the surprise. I will say there's, uh, there is a game in here, which I think you guys will like. There is a couple of books, and there are some collectibles, some cards, actually. Oh, again, we'll get to those. So, uh, in no particular order, let's just start pulling stuff out. Although I might save that one. I'll start with this one. Uh, if I can get it here. In fact, bag is just a it's just a reusable bag uh, it's nothing special in fact I'm gonna move it out of the way for the moment uh, just to make a little more space to show off what we've got here so the first thing I've got is this Age of Empires art book called the art of empires. And this is uh, a really nice sort of coffee table type of book that shows uh, concept art and such for the Age of Empires games from Age of Empires 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the Age of Empires series, have been ever since the very first game. And so when I saw this, uh, I figured I'd better snatch it up, and I think I paid seven dollars, seven Canadian dollars for this, which is like, I don't know, five bucks American or something. It's hardcover, as you can see. And uh, it's decently thick. Now, I'm not sure if this was ever sold 
uh, on its own. I don't think it was, now that I'm looking at it. It doesn't appear to have any barcode or anything, or pricing on it. I suspect that this may have been included as a, um, as maybe part of an Age of Empires 3 Collector's Edition, but I don't know. Uh, one thing I'd like to hear from you guys, by the way, as I go through these items, uh, let me know down in the comments if you would like to see any more of these uh, more in-depth. I'd like to do a video with at least one of the items that I'm going to be showing you here today, like a dedicated video. Um, but uh, today we're going to be taking a fairly quick look at them, so if, if any of these particular items tickle your fancy and you really like to see more of them, please do leave a comment and let me know and I'll see what I can do. So on the front we've got some Age of Empires 3 art, which is, uh, Age of Empires 3 was set during the colonization of North America. Very um, colonial themes run throughout that game, so interesting setting, quite different actually from the first two games, and uh, very bold in its way. Uh, they changed a lot of things, they mixed up the, um, well they didn't mix up the genre, it was still fundamentally an RTS game, but um, they tried, they experimented with some interesting things. Ensemble Studios, of course, now dearly departed. Shut down by Microsoft back in, I don't know, 2007? Something like that? I don't remember exactly, but... But lots of neat art in here. You can see it's primarily focused on Age of Empires 3. Um, I think that's just because they it was a much bigger production. They had a lot more concept art, I suspect, for Age of Empires 3. But it does cover, uh, for instance, Age of Empires 1 <clears throat> in its Rise of Rome expansion which was recently, uh, they were remastered, uh, released as Age of Empires Definitive Edition, which uh, is a very faithful recreation of the original Age of Empires and its expansion. So if you have any nostalgia for that game, uh, it's well worth playing. Um, and like I say, faithful recreation, wart, warts and all. Uh, there are, you know, a lot of the things that I had forgotten about, such as the terrible pathfinding from that original 1997 release. Uh, that stuff is largely brought up to date, um, unchanged. So they gave it a new coat of paint, beautiful new graphics in the definitive edition. Um, but a lot of the actual mechanics of how things work are pretty much unchanged, for better or for worse. Anyway. I really like the graphics of Age of Empires 1. Very bright and colorful. Uh, one of the lead designers, Bruce Shelley, he has a saying. He says, the sun is always shining in Age of Empires, which is a, a statement about the tone of the game graphically, but I think also a statement about just the tone of the game in general. It's a, despite being about warfare and men murdering each other, uh, on mass, it is a fairly upbeat kind of a game in a way, a uh, series, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but the visuals are always very colorful and appealing, and it never got too gritty or grim dark or anything. Anyway, some other Age of Empires 1 stuff, some sketches and things, and somewhere in here, there we go, there is more. Uh, of the Age of Empires 1 stuff there, but uh, in the interest of time, we're just going to move ahead. Age 2, Age of Kings and the Conqueror's Expansion. What a masterpiece that was. Improved upon the original game in pretty much every way, you know, mechanically. Um, moved forward to the medieval period. 
uh, still played quite a bit actually competitively. There's a big AoE2 competitive scene even to this day. It was revived by um, the uh, Age of Empires 2 HD which was released oh I don't know back in 2014 or something maybe. I could be totally wrong about that but they um, they didn't really change the graphics at all. Unlike Age of Empires 1 Definitive Edition where they redid all the sprites and everything, AOE 2 HD was pretty much just a straight port of the old game to work better on modern systems, but it still retains the old graphics, which, uh, again, they have aged really well. Like, look, at, look at that. It looks almost like a painting. It's really lovely. So they did a great job with those old sprites and their limited color palette. Again, it's bright, it's uh, attractive, and vibrant. Uh, Age of Empires 2, heck of a game. And uh, when they updated it to the HD edition, uh, you know, in recent years, they actually put out a couple of new expansions. There's new content for Age of Empires 2 out there, for any of you who may not be aware. Um, it introduces new races, you know, new campaigns, um, I haven't played through all of it, I must admit. I've played a little bit of it, but uh, it seems good. seems to dovetail nicely and fit in well with the old content. Some interesting concept art sketches. Alright, let's jump ahead a little bit. Age of Empires 3. So this was that... Like I said, colonial entry in the series. And they really went heavy on the story with this one. There's uh, cinematics um, and sort of uh, characters, main characters, which they had sort of touched on in Age 2, but not to the same degree. Um, this appears to be a lot of them here. And I guess this is some various character models for the various civs. Um, yeah, lots of them. Another game that actually has uh, stood up remarkably well over time, the graphics hold up again. Um, up close like this, you know, you can see sort of the low resolution nature of some of these textures, but, uh, but I recently reinstalled H3, and, uh, it plays really nicely on modern systems. Uh, it'll play in widescreen, no problem. The interface is a bit stretched, but um, the game window is, is fine. Um, you know, it'll anti-alias quite happily uh, at high settings. It looks pretty good. Uh, I thought it looked really quite advanced for its time, honestly. And, um, and yeah, I think it's held up quite well. Rumor has it. Rumor has it that, um, it looks like John Marston, Red Dead of Empires, <laughs> Age of Red Dead, um, rumor has it that there's going to be HD remasters of H2 and H3 with redone graphics in the style of Age of Empires 1 Definitive Edition, or in that spirit. Um, that was announced maybe two years ago now, and we have not heard or seen anything of it since, so I'm a little skeptical those are still in the works, but I do know that Relic, they of Dawn of War and Company of Heroes, Relic is working on Age of Empires 4. That was announced again about two years ago, and aside from a teaser uh, trailer and you know, the announcement itself. Um, we have seen nor heard nothing of Age of Empires 4, so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, really hoping that we see something of it at E3 this year. I think we have to. I think we have to. So, anyway, that is the Age of Empires story. The art of empires.
and I think for, like I said, seven bucks, what a steal. So cool. So, bumping the camera. Very nostalgic for me because, I, like I said, I, all these games were quite formative for me. Um, I've said it before on the channel here, but Age of Empires 1 is one of the games that really um, served to kickstart my love of the ancient world. Uh, and I think it's a great testament to the power of video games to inspire young minds. One of the reasons that I've done uh, the traveling that I have, and I know one of the reasons that my my younger brother, uh, who is also a big age fan, um, followed the career path that he did. He's an anthropologist and an archaeologist. So, it's pretty cool. Alright, uh, let's move on. So, I'm just going to put that over here, let's say. And let's bring back the big bag of treats, bag of goodies. Uh, let's do, oh heck, let's do the game next. I think you guys are going to like this. This, my friends. This is a boxed copy of The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. And I'm hoping it's not too dark on screen for you. But look at this box. This is a heck of a box. So Daggerfall, as I said, second entry in The Elder Scrolls series. It came out in 1996. It was a follow-up to Arena, which came out in 1994. Um, Dakerfall came out before I was aware of the Elder Scrolls. I came into the Elder Scrolls series with Morrowind, pardon me, um, which was uh, obviously a landmark title in that series. But um, and I, I've gone back and I've tried to play a little bit of Dakerfall, played a, played a bit, but uh, really never never very far. It's available for free actually, on uh, Bethesda's website, Bethesda.net. Uh, you can get it for zero dollars and play through it there. Uh, and I believe it's just played through a DOSBox emulator. But, um, but I saw this box, and uh, I asked, you know, the guy that runs the shop, uh, what's this, what was he selling it for? And he hadn't really thought about it. He sort of had it up as a display item. And I guess nobody had asked about it over all these years. Uh, or actually, I don't know how long he's had it. But anyway, um, he says, you know, if it was in really good condition, and if everything was there in the box, if it was a complete package, it looks like this kind of thing goes for upwards of $200 on eBay, you know. But the box is a bit dog-eared. You know, it's got some rough edges and it's got some scratches on the front here. And, uh, we'll get inside in a moment, but there's one or two little inserts, inconsequential inserts, that are missing. Anyway, uh, he's like, I'll give it to you for 20 bucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a far cry from 200, so 20 Canadian dollars is what I paid for this box copy. Almost complete box copy of Daggerfall. So, um, there's a lot to see here. Uh, again, the art is very extra. <laughs> it's like some kind of ghoul or zombie or maybe a character with more significance. I'm not sure, but it's all blinged out with this foil effect. So everything is shiny and psychedelic. You got the Bethesda Softworks up here, of course. Daggerfall was the first game that Todd Howard worked on, or the first Elder Scrolls game that Todd Howard worked on at Bethesda. He may have worked on some of their other titles previously, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> he did not lead or design or produce um, Daggerfall, I believe. He was a, just a, a programmer at the time, or a junior designer, I'm not sure. But of course, he ended up taking the lead on Morrowind, and... Uh, and we know how that went. <laughs> it's a legendary game. Um, anyway. The Elder Scrolls. Ch 
chapter two. <laughs> That's what it says up here. I don't know if you can see that. There, the Elder Scrolls chapter two. And on the back here, we've got <laughs> all kinds of screenshots and information about the game. Um, it's hard for me to show them to you just because of the angle, but I'll try and get up close here for you. Again, the whole thing is just done up in this foil finish, this shiny finish, which is so over the top, but it does catch the eye. And that's partly why I bought it, actually. I'm, not a huge physical game collector, um, but this is just such a unique box and package, and it's kind of pretty in its own way. Very 90s game, PC game kind of way. Um, and you can see it is a little rough, you know, it's it's got wear along all the edges, uh, and little scratches here and there, but that kind of adds to the charm, doesn't it? This is a well-loved box. Uh, on the back here it reads, Return again to the world of Tamriel. The Elder Scrolls Daggerfall is the second chapter in the highly acclaimed Elder Scrolls role-playing series. Its predecessor, Tess Arena, won over 20 Best Role-Playing Game of the Year awards and set a new level for computer role-playing. Tess Daggerfall is the most ambitious CRPG ever created and surpasses the high standard set in Arena. It goes on here, there's more. I'll read this, I'll read the next paragraph because it's pretty good. Daggerfall offers you an opportunity to adventure in total freedom within a world where your destiny is of your own making and consequence evolves from your decisions. A world of love and darkness, magic and sorcery. Whether you choose to follow a quest or to venture out alone, you will interact with thousands of people as you travel across an expansive land in a time of fantasy and imagination. <laughs> this is very cheesy, and it's a little bit edgelordy. Uh, like, you get, you know, it's like this blade here, dripping blood, and then this, this rose down at the bottom, very edgy. It's so dark. <laughs> um... So that's pretty funny, but anyway, just a really cool piece of video game memorabilia for a series that obviously became, um, you know, uh, iconic. You know, one of the uh, premier series in the world, but this was back well before all that. Let's open it up quickly, just take a quick look at what's inside. Again, if, if you guys are interested in seeing a video with more, uh, a more detailed inspection of this stuff, by all means, let me know, and we'll take a look at it, uh, because there's some good stuff in here. There's, uh, there's the manual, back from the age when games came with manuals, and it's, it's a pretty substantial one. It's a, it's a thick one. So lots to see in there. Lots of words. Goodness, lots of words. Daggerfall user's guide. <laughs> this looks like it's off uh, King of Hearts or something. The, you know, the style of the Elder Scrolls, it took a while for it to, to take hold, for them to find their niche and figure out what it was going to be. All about skills, attributes, character generation options, interface, hotkeys. Like this thing is substantial. Guilds, taverns, palaces. The world of Tamriel, the shops of Daggerfall. 
exploring the Iliac Bay. This is all perhaps even a little more relevant than it was uh, even a year or two ago. <laughs> Look at this. Somebody has, has written in here. Some soul back in the day crossed out acidic field. I don't know why, but they put an X there. And then down at the bottom, they've added some more spells. Calm humanoid. Uh, what is this? Charm mortal. And buoyancy. They've written this information in. That is just great. This is well loved. Somebody played this game, engaged with this stuff. Oh, look at that. Daedra, dragons, vampires, slaughter fishes, <laughs> centaurs. Okay. Lycanthropes, spriggans, all kinds of creatures that, well, I mean, Really, they're part of generic fantasy fiction, <laughs> uh, but that you still find in the Elder Scrolls today. Apparently. Anyway, I could spend forever looking at this, but uh, that's not the point of this video. There's the game disc. It did come on CD-ROM. I believe it works with DOS. I don't think this is a Windows version. Yeah, it says right there to install. And D colon enter. And D is your CD-ROM drive. So this is intended to work for DOS, and work on DOS, not Windows. Although it's a little funny, because this came out in 96, which was well after Windows 95 was released. But there was a transitional period there. And then this is a little lore insert, which I believe serves as a little advertisement for the strategy guide. Um, where it shows like a page of the official strategy guide here for one dungeon. This is a walkthrough for one dungeon in an attempt to get people to pick it up. Of course, back in 1996, online strategy guides were not really a thing. You might, uh, you might be lucky to find a text-based walkthrough, you know, by somebody, a player, uh, who, uh, who, you know, puts the solutions out there. But yeah, back in 96, uh, it was a different time. It was not, uh, there was no game facts. You couldn't just pop online, you know, search your game and the solution to a dungeon and have it pop up. Uh, the meta build, for instance, was probably not listed online. Anyway, and then this great 90s video game advertising. strategy guide. An advertising supplement to PC Gamer Magazine. It says along the top here. PC Gamer Magazine. How many of you guys read PC Gamer? I read PC Gamer a lot back in the day. It was my gaming magazine of choice. Look at all these awesome old games. I've not even played or heard of any of these. Starfighter Killing Time. Ward. Space Ward Ho. Hmm. Uh, Heroes of Might and Magic. There's one I recognize. Anyway. Uh, PC Mag Gamer Magazine. I started reading PC Gamer back in... Um, 2001, probably, was when I really started reading it. Maybe 2000. And I remember, I remember, <coughs> pardon me, I remember reading the review for Morrowind, again, before I knew what The Elder Scrolls was, before I'd ever played any of it. I remember reading the review for Morrowind and thinking it looked super, super cool. It's another idea for a video that I've had kicking around in the back of my mind for many years, uh, which is see if I can uh, dig around in my parents' basement and find uh, some of my old copies of PC Gamer, because I'm pretty sure they're in boxes down there somewhere, and do a little trip down memory lane looking at some of those old issues of PC Gamer magazine. Maybe look for some iconic game reviews 
from the past, you know, that with our modern perspective, we now know how important or pivotal they were, such as Morrowind. If that is something you guys would be into, let me know down below. Leave a comment. All right, on to the next item from our bag of treasures. Let's do another book next. Hmm. So this. This is something <clears throat> that I had no idea existed until I saw it at the Vorpal Gnome. Uh, this is a Diablo, an official Diablo 2 supplement for Dungeons and & Dragons. And it turns out that Blizzard partnered with uh, Wizards of the Coast to produce two volumes um, that adapt uh, Diablo 2 to the D&D 3rd edition uh, rule set. And this is one of them. And actually, I got the other one too. They were both there. Um, but I don't have it here because... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm house-sitting at my parents' place right now, and I left it over there and forgot to bring it here because I'm reading it right now. The other one is like the core rule book for the adaptation, if you want to call it that. It has all the, uh, uh, like the classes uh, are adapted um, into D&D rules. And, uh, but this is like the lore one, basically. So this is a, uh, a campaign, essentially along with a whole bunch of lore entries uh, for various creatures and places and things. So, uh, once again, we'll take a quick look through it. This one's called Diablo 2, To Hell and Back. Uh, and, of course, I'm a huge fan of Diablo 2 as well, the whole Diablo series, Diablo 1 through 3, I love them all. Uh, again, Diablo was a very formative game for me, coming out right around the same time as Age of Empires, actually. <laughs> Diablo was not bright and sunny. Diablo is the opposite end of the spectrum. The sun is never shining in Diablo. Uh, it is grim dark. <laughs> and it takes itself pretty seriously. And it's a little, you know, um, but whatever. You guys know what Diablo is. But um, anyhow, as soon as I saw this, I knew I had to have it because I just love the aesthetic and the setting and just the music, and just everything about Diablo 2. Anyway, let's take a look inside here. This, unfortunately, not hardcover. And of course, um, I don't play D&D 3rd Ed these days. Uh, I play 5th Ed, and so these rules are definitely somewhat outdated. But uh, they could be adapted. There are ways to do that, especially just if you want to adapt the flavor of the setting. Um, you can certainly do that, and this kind of literature gives you great inspiration for running your own campaigns. Rogue Encampment. So there you go. You look at that. Fans of Diablo 2 will recognize the Rogue Encampment from the beginning of that game. This is your home base in Act 1. So this, uh, like I said, is this whole pre-made campaign. Rogue Monastery was at, uh, what's this? The Den of Evil. <laughs> Classic. Classic. That's so good. So, I haven't really read through this one yet. The Secret of the Vigerai. Yeah, this is really cool. It's too bad it's not in hardcover, and it's too bad it's not in color, but uh, I'm still really thrilled that I found these, because like I said, I had no idea they existed, and uh, this is so totally right up my alley. 1,000% relevant to my interests. The 
Just reckon there's that guy. I don't know if I can get any closer to the screen here for you, but that's that's Terio. And yeah, it adapts all the character classes. Uh, you've got your Amazons and your Paladins, and there's a big bestiary of creatures. A bunch of spells. It's interesting that they, uh, the way they adapt uh, an action RPG into a turn-based tabletop game, you know, um, D and D doesn't use, for instance, mana points for its casting, uh, whereas Diablo two very much does. But uh, they have these checks in place that make it so that uh, every time you use certain classes of spells, uh, there's a chance that you won't be able to use them again for the day. Otherwise, like you basically your spells, you can use an unlimited number of times a day. But each time you have to roll a certain type of check, depending on what your class is. If you fail that check, then you have to consume a mana potion to regain the ability to use that spell in that day. That's kind of how they get around that. A mega demon. <laughs> Amazing. Mosquito demon. So these books were published in 2000, coincident with the publication of D&D Third Ed. There's the world of Diablo II. Sanctuary, I suppose, is what the world of Diablo is. West March, over here. Barbarian homelands, Mount Ariat up here. Keji Stan, which is Act Three of Diablo II. Loot Golain over here in the deserts of Aranok. <laughs> so, that's what that's about. And like I said, there is another uh, volume. And this has got a $20 price tag on it, but because he was, uh, he was uh, clearing stuff out for the move, I got it for half that. So I think I paid $15 or something for the two of these books. So... The other one's a little less interesting, just because there's not quite as much in it. It's more rules-focused, a little less uh, flavor-focused, but again, if you'd like to see a video uh, featuring these books, please do let me know. Alright, it's time to move on to the last, the final item in my bag here. And this one was a bit of an impulse buy, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I have no idea, ultimately, what its value is, uh, you know, from a collector's perspective, but even from my perspective, like, usability. Um, this right here is the complete 1992 Trading Card Factory set from TSR, uh, and TSR was the creator of Dungeons and Dragons. It is the company that Gary Gygax created to publish, to self-publish D&D uh, back in the day, and it was the publisher of D&D right up until 1997, when it was bought by Wizards of the Coast, who owns it to this day. Um... TSR, I think, stands for Tactical Strategy S Rules, I think. Tactical Strategy Rules, something like that. It's kind of a weird name, but um, anyway, what this is is a whole collection of trading cards from a whole bunch of different uh, game systems and settings that TSR produced. Uh, back in 1992. Um, you can recognize a number of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, sort of uh, famous Dungeons and Dragons settings, like Forgotten Realms, of course, Dragonlance, which is the setting that a whole bunch of D&D novels set in, I believe. Um, but then there's these other ones that I've never heard of before, like Spelljammer. Is that what that is? Okay, let me read it. Yeah, Spelljammer. 
no idea what that is. Never, ever played it. Um, Ravenloft, of course. So, uh, I don't know what Dark Sun is. Never played that or uh, played in that setting. But uh, each of these cards is um, uh, a trading card in its own right, but it also has a stat block for that creature. So let's just pull out a random one here. I have no idea what's in here. Okay, what is this? A Phalirith. Phalirith. <laughs> um, this is from the, uh, oops, the Greyhawk setting. And, and I'm not quite clear even, and pardon my ignorance, I think all of these can be played uh, in the D&D rule set, at the very least, in a D20-based system. But I think they're all different settings for the D&D rule set. And at this time, in 1992, this would have been the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons rule set, AD&D, which was essentially a, a second edition, if you will. Um, but anyway, on the back here uh, is a stat block for this creature um, so that you could integrate it into your campaigns or your play sessions. And of course, again, this is a very outdated rule set now, but uh, 750 different creatures uh, spread across all these different settings, uh, stats for all of them, cool little pieces of artwork for all of them, and uh, I think this was priced at $15.00. And again, it gave me a discount on it. I think I paid 10 or 8 or something for it. That's some pretty good value, <laughs> in my opinion. Whether you take these rules and adapt them for, you know, for 5th edition or whatever, or, or for Pathfinder, for that matter, you could use them. Or whether you just use them as inspiration for your own creatures in your own campaigns. Uh, this is a... Gilidarius. This is a dour looking fellow, isn't he? A 15th level black robe wizard. <laughs> Background, let's read, let's read a little bit of this. It says here, And Gilidarius was a pupil of the infamous Raistlin Majere long ago. He now seeks his lost master, but he has not had any luck in opening a portal to the abyss. He is not nearly as charming as Rastlin was, Rastlin, and most keep their distance from him. Gilidarius may be very old, but his evil ambition is not the least bit diminished. This is from the Dragonlance setting. So, uh, again, I know nothing about these as trading cards or collectibles. No idea if they hold any value whatsoever, but quite frankly, I don't care because I think it's just really cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can see a pretty fun video where we just go through this giant stack of cards, just pulling out random ones, looking at what kind of creatures there are, what the art is like, what the rules for them are like. There's even some things over here that are still sealed, and I have no idea what these are. Maybe these are rarer somehow. Grim Reaper, it says. It's also quite possible that these are... Ah, uh, this is an incomplete set. You know, maybe the rarest ones have been taken out. Again, it's whatever. I didn't buy these for their collector's value, if they hold such a thing. Uh, I bought them because I think they're neat. And I think they can provide really cool inspiration for future stuff. This looks like items. Magical necklace. That is a heck of a necklace. That is serious. <laughs> Who would wear? Who would wear that? Uh, anyway. Um, I don't know if it says anything else interesting on here. Includes all the rare and normal numbered cards in the 1992 series. Every card counterfeit proof, it says up here. The only official AD&D 2nd Edition collector cards.
And to be quite honest, I don't know if these were available in another format. Like if you could buy these uh, in booster packs, for instance, or as singles, or, or what. Uh, or if they were only available in a complete set like this. In which case, the whole concept of a trading card seems a little weird. If you can only buy the whole set, <laughs> what are you trading? You've already got them all. I have no idea. But maybe you could buy them in, in booster packs. Like random blind packs. I don't know. So, anyway, once again, please do let me know if you would like to see a video with these. I have a funny feeling there's going to be at least one person requesting a video with each of these items I've shown you here today. And I don't know if I could go that far, but the most most requested one, let's say, uh, I will endeavor to do a video with. Maybe the top two, if there's a lot of excitement. We'll just have to see. Feel it out. Let's grab another couple out of here just to look at them. This is a piece of equipment. Magical gloves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reglar's gloves of freedom from magic. XP value 5,000. Description. Through further research and experimentation with magic, Reglar created a pair of gloves that improves upon the principles from his original gloves of freedom. The gloves of freedom from magic operate as a dispel magic spell, 12th level. By rolling a successful hit against unwilling opponents, or merely touching willing ones, the glove's power is released. The wearer must specifically name the effect he is attempting to negate. The gloves can be used three times per day. They do not protect the wearer from any spells directed against them. That's a shame. <laughs> Let's do one last one. Let's just, uh, no, I don't know. Let's try here. Okay, what is this? A uh, storm giant. <laughs> Got some pretty serious bling there. A big old sword. <laughs> Storm giants. Storm giants are gentle and reclusive, living off the land around their lairs, but they can be very dangerous when angry. They're immune to electricity and lightning. They're born with water breathing ability and accumulate more magical abilities as they age. In battle, they wield gigantic, two-handed swords. As you can see there. I guess this little seal, this little foil seal on each of these, is what they mean by counterfeit proof. It's supposed to make it harder to counterfeit them. Again, I don't know if it mattered in the long run, because I don't know if these were particularly desirable, but I might look them up, just out of curiosity, you know. Just to see. So that, my friends, was my bag of treasures. That is what was in my bag. <laughs> that was my nerd shop haul. Uh, like I said, I had a lot of fun finding these items, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video as well. Hope you had fun looking through some uh, old nerd stuff. Yeah, I know a lot of you are younger viewers, and this stuff maybe holds no value to you. It's just oldy, moldy stuff, but um, for slightly older viewers like myself, uh, this stuff holds a lot of nostalgia. And this is really fun, especially when you get good deals on it. Like I said, I think I spent, I don't know, 50-ish dollars, I guess, on all this altogether or something. It wasn't much in the long, uh, or in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so, anyhow, thank you all very much for watching. Please do leave a comment down below if you would like uh, to see an in-depth video with any of these particular items. And I will read all the comments and uh, try and figure out what people are requesting the most and try and make that happen. And of course, I never really say this, but if you enjoy this content and would like to see more of it, please... Uh, consider hitting that subscription button and uh, that bell icon so you'll be notified when I'm posting more ASMR videos. Alright, 
Thanks again for watching, guys. And I look very forward to having you back here next time. Bye for now.